Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the first session of the Antinatalist Advocacy Conference 2023. So, um, Sorry, I wasn't with you in the um, in the welcome address, um, but here I am now. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, the first thing I want to say and get out of the way straight away is this is our first time doing it. I'm sure John has already said this, but because um, it's our first time, we will be grateful if everyone bears with us for any sort of technical issues or anything that might come up. So um, I am joined by David Pierce now. Um, so welcome to the first session with David Pearson and thank you for, for coming, David. Um, so I'm going to give a quick. Um, so I'll, I'll just in a, in a second, tell you how to submit, uh, the audience questions. So. It looks like I may be having some internet issues. Hopefully, this won't persist. All right. Um, so, uh, David will be talking about um, antinatalism and selection pressure, the case for genome reform and a biohappiness revolution. Um, so, David is a philosopher who shares the sort of pessimistic evaluation of, of sentient uh, life and its predicament uh, with antinatalists, but um, advocates for a sort of different approach to uh, remedying this this problem as we see it. So David David uh, is a proponent for transhumanism. Um, David has been prolific in in this area. Um, in 1995, he wrote uh, the now famous hedonistic imperative, um, and he there lays out the case um, and potential sort of roadmap for uh, the abolition of suffering. Um, so since then, David has given many, many talks and engagements on the topic and in 1998 helped set up the World Transhumanist Association, which is now called Humanity Plus. Um, so I think it's safe to say we are in safe hands with David on the topic of transhumanism um, as an alternative to antinatalism. Um, so... A quick one on how to submit questions. So you will, I'm sure, want to be submitting questions to David as he's giving his talk. You can submit questions anytime. All you need to do is go to the description and there's a link in there uh, to a form or it's in a pinned message in the live chat. So send your messages in there and we will get to some of those at the end. Um, so I think that is it. Um, that is yeah welcome david thank you so much for for coming uh thank you lawrence uh thank you everyone uh yes i'm a transhumanist uh, transhumanists believe in creating a triple s civilization of super intelligence super longevity and super happiness and my own focus has been on uh, phasing out the biology of suffering in human and non-human animals and replacing the architecture, existing architecture of mind with life based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss, reprogramming the biosphere. Now, what has this got to do with antinatalism? Um, any casual uh, viewer might, might wonder. Essentially, I should really be starting this discussion, and it really is going to be a discussion because I haven't got a, a set text or, or, or anything like that. Uh, really, to show the nature of Darwinian life, it would really be appropriate to have some extremely gory, ghastly stuff. Statist you know, the statistics, 800,000 people taking their own lives each year, some... So, so basically a, a lot of horror stories, but we're not going to do that. Um, anything I could conceivably show in the way of gore wouldn't begin to do justice to the horrors of, of, of Darwinian life. We are sentient malware. And if there was such a thing as an off button, I would press it. If I thought so-called 
hard anti-natalism, i.e. the idea that everyone everywhere should stop having children and we should somehow use cross-species sterilization or something, something like that to, to prevent the suffering of non-human animals, I would be going down uh, that route. Um, Unfortunately, any possible solution to the problem of suffering and the horrors of, of Darwinian malware, it's not enough for it to be technically feasible. It's also got to be sociologically realistic. And this is the problem with so-called hard antinatalism. Uh, hard antinatalism is just not viable most people for evolutionary reasons are absolutely determined uh, to have to have children and no amount of reasoned argument that antinatalists use is is going to is going to change what to change what most people most people think uh, Involuntary childlessness. I mean, millions of people worldwide are involuntarily child, child free, causes immense suffering. People go to quite extraordinary lengths to reproduce. I mean, now with uh, in vitro uh, fertilization techniques, you get 70 year old, you know, 70 year olds in India actually deciding to, uh, uh, to, uh, to have children. And so I, um, I feel that hard antinatalism, extinctionist antinatalism is a distraction and that what we really need to do is to build the broadest possible uh, coalition with life lovers to fix the problem of suffering. Um, I mean, a, a hard antinatalist might say, "Well, <laughs> beliefs aren't inherited. Beliefs aren't inherited. That if we pre we present sufficiently powerful, compelling reasons to persuade people not to have children, then we can bring about human extinction uh, 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 via via reason, logic, argument. Basically, it's just it's it's just not going to work." Um, so what should be done? Uh, I essentially advocate uh, a version of the abolitionist project. Uh, this is the idea that if we are prepared to tweak our genomes, we can create a world without suffering, life based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss. And this solution to the problem of suffering doesn't fall victim to selection pressure because flash forward a few decades, uh, imagine that all prospective parents have the option of choosing essentially the, the pain thresholds, the hedonic set points uh, and the hedonic range of their future children. What options are most parents going to choose? I mean, imagine, yeah, imagine you're a natalist and you can choose basically how happy or sad your child is, what kind of pain threshold your, chi your child has. Have you ever met these rare people who say, oh, pain is just a, a useful signaling mechanism. We already know the so-called volume knob for pain, the SCN9A gene, and it's got dozens of different alleles. Imagine just picking a benign allele for your kids so pain is trivialized like this. Uh, something like hedonic set points, it's more complicated, um, but tweaking even a couple of genes, the far and far out gene would enable essentially all prospective parents to have ki kids who are never anxious or depressed, uh, essentially happy. And there is likely to be intensifying selection pressure as the, as the reproductive revolution unfolds in favor of life based on gradients of well-being. Now, it's going to be a monumentally, technically, sociologically challenging process. I think it's realistically only going to unfold 
over hundreds of years. I mean, it could be sooner. If, if, if there are global consensus to fixing the problem of suffering, it could be done in uh, uh, 100, 100 years or, or, or less, but, but, but there isn't. But over time, there is going to be selection pressure in favor of benign alleles and allelic combinations. And in this, some would say, brave new world, uh, this, this re reproductive revolution, Essentially, there will come a time when bringing a child into existence is not immoral because that child is not going to suffer. Essentially, the child will be living a life based on gradients of intelligent well-being. Now, for evolutionary reasons, such children today are extremely rare. But nonetheless, it's technically feasible to create such kids, and there will be selection pressure in favor of doing so. Uh, the abolitionist project, in its broadest sense, goes beyond humans. Uh, within the next few decades, there is going to be a revolution of cultured meat, farm-free animal products, such that it would be possible to get the death factories shut and outlawed together, yes, with, with moral argument, but I'm very skeptical of any moral argument that actually calls on people to make any kind of personal sacrifice. So, yeah, the horrors of animal agriculture are likely to end this century. Now, naively, the problem of wild animal suffering is completely intractable. But thanks to developments in biotech, it's possible to sketch out uh, how one can have an entirely happy biosphere, that the level of suffering or happiness is going to be an adjustable parameter. And essentially, the rest of the rest of sentience can be inherently blissful too. Now, naively, that sounds completely ecologically illiterate. How on earth is this possible? Well, this is the beauty of something like uh, so-called gene drives uh, that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance. And let's say there is a broad global consensus that we want a living world in which all sentient beings can flourish. It's possible to choose a benign allele or allelic combination uh, in that one that is actually going to lead to a happy, flourishing, free living organism. Release a few hundred of organisms genetically modified in this way. And essentially, all members of the spe sexually reproducing species in question will inherit these benign alleles, even if they would normally carry a fitness cost to the individuals. So gene drives cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance. They're first going to be uh, used uh, to probably to defeat vector-borne disease in Africa, but they can also be used in principle to spread low-pain, happy alleles throughout the living world. And, so, you know, something like the problem of predation. Now, I personally think predators are absolutely monstrous. Serial killers, asphyxiating non-humans, absolutely dreadful. But most people you know, like members, love members of the cat family. They adore them. They're aghast at the thought of a world without lions and tigers. But Again, we can reprogram herbivorize pred predators if it is considered appropriate to do so. Um, and so, yeah, I and mean, I would it's this question I would ask hard extinction its antinatalists. If it were the case that we could phase out the biology of suffering, would you think uh, natalism was inherently? immoral and uh, why are we anti-natalists at all uh, essentially because yeah we, we know that life that, that life breeds suffering i said personally i'm a soft anti-natalist i wouldn't have children and i would urge uh, anyone else uh, uh, not not to 
not to bring these grotesque uh, genetic experiments in, 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 into the world. But this isn't a global solution to the problem of suffering. We have to be very hard-headed, realistic. Uh, essentially, one knows so many people who are fanatical life lovers. A lot of my colleagues worry about questions of existential risk. Talk of negative utilitarian button pressing, trying to eradicate humans' Darwinian life, it scares them. And if we are serious about fixing the problem of suffering, we are going to need to create the broadest possible coalition of life lovers. Um, yes, uh, essentially that is the gist of what I wanted to say. I was uh, sorry, what I've said has not corresponded very closely to the, the, uh, the, the, the slides that uh, Lawrence has, has, has kindly been showing. But yeah, really what I wanted to do is essentially open up the, dis open up the discussion amongst uh, and, and, and antinatal, antinatalists. Oh, yes, just looking at the slides now. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds absolutely crazy. You know, the world's last unpleasant uh, experience. But we do, thanks to genome editing technology, both germline and somatic gene therapy, have the ability to get rid of experience below hedonic, uh, hedonic zero. Um, it's very, very easy to, com to confuse uh, uh, you know, discussions of what is technically feasible with what is sociologically likely is this not just just wishful thinking but one only has to you know just just ask oneself imagine if you really yes could could choose the hedonic range of any sentient being you brought into the world what hedonic range would you choose and at the moment it would be horrifically expensive technically difficult but within a few centuries and more realistically a few decades it's going to become yeah pretty pretty easy to do something like uh, like that i mean before something like uh, tackling the problem of wild animal suffering one would do uh, studies in self-contained artificial biospheres this spikes a lot of guns if one's says, no, we're not going to be experimenting uh, recklessly with nature, we do pilot studies first. But, and there's this irony in that naively, it's gonna be easiest to fix the problem of suffering in humans than domestic and uh, human animals. And only ultimately, perhaps one day, the problem of, you know, imagine, you know, kind of, yeah, non-human suffering in, in, in Amazonia or deep in marine ecosystems, but synthetic gene drives turn this, uh, turn this chronology in its head. In principle, it would be possible to do this, this back to front. This isn't a, this isn't a prediction. Anyway, um, yes, okay, thank you. Uh, is reproduction inherently bad or is reproduction bad insofar as baby making creates involuntary suffering that's the question i would uh, question i would ask um <clears throat> yes i like to invoke the world health organization's definition of health because it is it is it's almost surreal here you have not so much a transhuman definition of health as a as a posthuman uh, definition of health. I mean, transhumanists argue for an architecture of mind based on information sensitive gradients of intelligent well being. But this is the World Health Organization to which all nations worldwide are signed up that is committed to a definition of health, complete well being. I mean, uh, short of something unimaginably technical, technically advanced, not transhuman, but post-human life, we are going to need to preserve information sensi sensitivity, gradients of well-being to preserve critical insight, social responsibility, intellectual progress. And yeah, so language is important. If you start talking about the language of enhancement, people cry, you know, eugenics, brave new world, it turns people off. 
But if you talk in terms of the language of health, no sentient being in history has been healthy as according, you know, by the lights of the WHO definition of health. And the slogan, watchword, good health for all, is potentially saleable in the way that a lot of extravagant transhumanist language isn't. Um, much more can be said, but I'd like now to uh, take some questions and explore some of the issues with people. All right, nice one. Um, well, cheers for that, David, and apologies for the, the slides not syncing up with everything. Oh, no, um, my talk wasn't synchronizing with things, is it? You see, I was extemporizing, but yeah, the, the, the slides contain the essence of what I wanted to say if anyone just wants to, yeah. uh, to, 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 to glance through them, yeah. Cool. Okay, nice one. All right, well, um, just to remind people, if you want to submit questions, then whack them in the form that's in the description and pinned in the live chat on uh, yeah, on YouTube. Um, so I've got a few prepared, well, I say a few, quite a few, quite a few prepared questions, um, and then we'll get on to audience questions later. So again, a reminder, um, submit them in the form. And also just to help us out, please try make them uh, succinct as well um, and to the point. So the first question I actually hadn't uh, written down, but we were talking before we came on air, um, we were talking about sort of like the transhumanist community in general. And one thing I said that I'd be interesting to ask you when we're on air is um, like how you, you told me that even within the transhumanist uh, world, there are divides on what we should be aiming at. And you were saying that you have this sort of focus on eradicating suffering, but that's not actually the focus for all transhumanists. Are you able to, just for the benefit of people who, you know, this might be some of the people watching, it might be their first time even hearing about transhumanism. Are you able to just give a bit of a description of the landscape of how common actually is it for transhumanists to have the same concerns as you do? Well, on the bright side, the Transhumanist Declaration of 1998, revised in 2009, includes a commitment to the well-being of all sentience. But there's a great uh, sort of irony in that the World Transhumanist Association was set up by a combination by two people, a button-pressing negative utilitarian and someone one of whose main fo focuses is fo foci, uh, foci uh, is existential risk, Nick Bostrom. And most transhumanists are fanatical life lovers thinking about existential risk. And the focus of, of most transhumanists is either super intelligence or super longevity. Uh, super longevity is the idea that just as Silicon robots can be upgraded and repaired indefinitely. It's going to be possible to do the same to organic robots and essentially give us effectively quasi-immortal lives, eternal youth. And given that aging and outerly causes horrendous suffering, I support research into radical anti-aging and the use of cryonics, even cryothanasia to defang death. Uh, the other of the three supers, super intelligence, super longevity, super happiness, the other big super is super intelligence. This ranges from, so, well, a different form of, ex, of, of, of uh, extinctionism, which essentially says that uh, our machines are going to replace humans, so-called intelligence explosion, a scenario in which recursively self-improving software-based AI, essentially runaway, run, runaway super intelligence, humanity, Darwinian life is going to replace that way. Then there is the Kurtzweilian conception of super intelligence in which effectively humans are going to merge with our machines, something like mind uploading too. But there's a third conception of super intelligence, the one I find most sociologically, technically credible which is the idea that, yeah, humans are going to become extinct, but the reason is we are going to edit our genetic source code and in conjunction with AI, neuroprosthesis, essentially are going to rewrite ourselves out of existence. 
and talk of you know something like a chrysalis becoming a butterfly or, or something like that it scares people less than saying that you want humans to become extinct which i do and our anti-natalists do uh, we just differ in the way this is going to happen mm. yeah you and you you've already kind of referenced the fact that you know let's say that the lay person and for anyone who you know because i know there'll be people watching from all around the world um lay person just means you're like the average person on the street you know um when they hear the ideas of transhumanism uh you know and uh, especially to the radical extent of you know moving into um you know altering uh, ecosystems and wild animals a lot of the people are going to find it, you know, the, the average people who aren't people like us who think about these things all the time. So we're kind of, it seems normal to us to talk about it. But a lot of people would listen to these ideas and think that they're like crazy. Um, and I think, especially since, you know, a lot of the world is still quite religious, quite conservative, these ideas won't sit well with them. Um, how do you think that transhumanism and especially you know the specific message that you're trying to put forward how can it have like a pr makeover like what is the best way that it can be presented to the average person and the average politician that will actually mean that it could at some point get widespread public support Yes, in terms of PR, if one is trying to sell the mass message of compassionate ecosystems, often best to start with something like a peaceable kingdom of Isaiah and the lion and the wolf lying down with the lamb. Although it sounds madcap transhumanist stuff, the actual vision of a happy, peaceful living world, it's, it's in the Bible. And I don't know how many people precisely worldwide would call themselves biblical literalists, or at least if asked, would say that the Bible is the word of God. But, yeah, it's all prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Um, needless to say, the book of Isaiah was a bit light on the technical details of how this was going to happen. Uh, but, yeah, that's a good way, I think, to, to start discussions. I mean, the other, the other thing, too, though, uh, people's reactions to wildlife documentaries uh, are, are quite telling. And unfortunately, a lot of standard wildlife documentaries has got a, much relation to the realities of life in nature as Kim Il-sung propaganda video or, or something like that. But nonetheless, when... You see on screen, let's say, you know, a baby elephant stuck or dying in a waterhole or some uh, photogenic creature in distress. Uh, a lot of viewers protest right in, why didn't the cameraman intervene? And mm. every cubic meter of the planet is shortly going to be accessible to surveillance, micromanagement and control. And once one actually establishes the principle of compassionate intervention, asking people, is it right or wrong for the camera crew to intervene to help this struggling, distressed elephant, then one can go on to, to, to generalize. Because if you ask people in the abstract, is it right or wrong to intervene in nature? Most people would say it's wrong uh, because it's, it's not natural. But if you focus on specific instances, you'll often get a different response. Mm. And there's a different kind of person, people let's say high AQ, the systematizers on the more on the autistic spectrum, who, yeah, just going into questions of principles, rules, do we want uh, a happy biosphere? One can one one can talk about things in a much more gentle generalized way but focusing on specific examples i think uh, uh resonates more deeply with most people yeah no i i agree with you and i think also you know a lot of people would would reject you know human sort of enhancement if you want to put it that way along transhumanist lines but if you you know if you offer them the sort of immediate ways that this can actually benefit those that they love or will love you know, like, for example, being able to uh, reduce the risk of, of their 
soon to be born child, uh, you know, their risk of cancer or depression, then I think, you know, that would have much more widespread appeal than if someone just said, let's build a future where, you know, everyone is, you know, a cyborg or something, you know, do you get what I mean? Something like that. Yes, yes. So start mm. starting at the basic stuff rather than presenting the sort of the end stage of it, as it were, as it were. Um, yeah, my next question was going to be, and you've, you, you've, you've kind of referen referenced a few things that I wanted to include in this. So you've referenced um, gene editing, but also um, the future technologies we'll have access to that will, well, if we choose to develop them, uh, that will allow, you know, all encompassing surveillance, as you just talked about, um, and things of this kind. Um, do you think that there is a risk that the very technologies and capacities that we would need to develop to realize a transhumanist future or the transhumanist future you paint, do you not think there's a risk that those very technologies and capacities could be uh, misused? And, you know, if they fall into the wrong hands, being able to, you know, edit the genes of people, you know, so that you can essentially mold them however you like to surveil everyone that you would want to, um, is is there not a risk that those could fall, if they do fall into the wrong hands, you know, maybe a government or some sort of terrorist organization, that could be really bad. So would it not be better just to keep them in, in you know, not developed, essentially? Let's just not bring them about. I... <laughs> I suppose I believe in some form of sadly, well, not sadly, scrap the word sadly, in technological determinism in, in so far as these technologies are going to come about. And though I've been singing a happy song about how it's going to be possible to reprogram the biosphere, happy, flourishing, sentient beings, yes, there are all manner of ways uh, in which these technologies can be used and abused, you know, the uh, the surveillance that could be used to ensure that all, all sentient beings flourish could also be used in this kind of global panopticon, big brother, totalitarian uh, state. Um, so why cautiously do I think that, and this, you know, this, this happy biosphere is going to happen? Essentially because most people, they may be callous but they're not for the most part malicious one of the reasons today for example that most people would dismiss actively helping non-humans in nature is that it's crazy to talk of doing so while we're systematically hurting and harming and killing billions of sentient beings in factory farms and you know how many fish each year but basically yeah essentially we are harming non-human animals on a colossal scale and the idea that humans might actually switch from systematically harming to helping sounds absolutely fanciful but once it involves zero personal inconvenience once essentially customers can just pick the cruelty free options off the supermarket shelves and choose the kind of cruelty cruelty-free option in, uh, in in a restaurant. Yeah, most people don't like suffering cruelty. They don't want to think about it. So, yeah, I mean, it, obviously it sounds really, really fanciful today, talk of reprogramming the biosphere. But, yeah, the technology is going to be there. Uh, the costs of doing so are going to, are going to collapse. And the sequencing the first human genome cost or something it was about a billion or something like that the, you know the price has cost has collapsed there gene drives synthetic CRISPR gene drives the pro their very nature means that the price uh, obviously there need to be expensive pilot studies but the actual price for helping hundreds of thousands even millions of free living species is actually surprising surprisingly cheap you only you only need to release a few hundred of the genetically modified organisms uh, for the gene to spread to the entire species right now trying to create a pan species welfare state or something like that the cost would be 
many trillions it's not realistic but in the but in an era when factory farms have disappeared and the only remaining large source of involuntary suffering is 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 nature uh yeah it's going to be, these are going to be fixable fixable problems mm. so one one thing that sort of leads on from your answer you were talking you know a lot about how at the moment we are actively harming you know the other sentient beings that that are on this planet you know and you know many of them being in factory farms and we sort of you know we force them onto this planet and then just sort of abuse them for their whole lives do you so both both of us are um are ethical vegans and so i wanted to ask you how does um how does the how does having a care for animals um and usually that is coupled with the rejection of their experimentation how does that fit with pursuing transhumanist technologies because i i may be wrong here but i'm assuming that some level of animal experimentation may have to happen to bring these technologies about um can you comment on that like how how much would anim animal experimentation be involved in that and then does that lead us to be um more uh apprehensive about about pursuing it mm. Difficult issues. A very large number of experimental procedures don't or needn't involve harm or suffering. Uh, the ethically really problematic questions come of procedures that, that do involve suffering. And though it sounds a bit of a cop out, I normally say if a procedure would be recognized as wrong if performed on a human, it shouldn't be performed on a non-human of, of comparable sentience either. And there are a lot of really messy issues uh, here. I said I'm personally ethically a negative utilitarian, but I'm also an ethical utilitarian who believes we should uphold in law the sanctity of life, not because I literally believe in the sanctity of life. I think Darwinian malware is monstrous, but if one doesn't uphold the sanctity of life, the actual consequences will tend uh, to, yeah, to, to, to be worse. Um, sorry for not properly answering your question. Mm. Uh, uh, essentially, there isn't an off-the-shelf answer I, I can give you. Some vegans, as you know, would say absolutely all animal experimentation, non-human animal experimentation is wrong. I would say it's not wrong if you no know, suffering is involved. The complication, it's a huge complication, uh, is when suffering is involved. Mm. Um, no, I, I no, I look, I can understand um, the, I can understand the uh, wanting to avoid having to pursue anything like that. You know, there's a lot of research that's done, or you know, experimentation that's done on animals that even if you just remove the ethical side like it just would doesn't need to be done you know it, it's not fruitful at all um and so much of it even if you're you know removing the ethical considerations much of it can um you know be gotten rid of anyway but it it does seem like to pursue these technologies there will be some level of experimentation that will have to go on and or maybe not you know maybe by the time that we get to this being pursued in a widespread way maybe we will have uh alternatives um mm. i i to be honest i think this is one of those ethical questions where it doesn't have like a definitive answer and it's just going to divide people who want to aim at the same thing but the means of getting there may may divide them so to be honest i don't think there is a definitive definitive answer and all especially yes that kind of all sexual reproduction is a genetic experiment untested unplanned unpredictable consequences though one can be fairly confident that whether it's a human or non-human animal there is going to be a great deal of intense suffering involved in mm. the experiment so yeah so um another question i'm going to go to audience questions in a minute but another question I had was, um, let's say that, you know, 
the majority of people watching now, they're like, okay, I loved hearing what David was talking about. I'm fully signed up. I want to help push this forward as well. What are the best ways that just individuals, you know, can help propagate um, this sort of suffering focused transhumanism? What, how, how can we as, as individual people, you know, do that? Do, can we do things on our own? Do we need to organize? Can we be absorbed by existing structures? Do we need to make new structures? I wish I could report that there was uh, an abolitionist party society dedicated to this. Unfortunately, there is a leadership vacuum. There is an organizational vacuum. Most transhumanists, as I was reporting earlier, uh, are not really focused on the problem of suffering. Uh, something like effective altruism might seem a natural home, but at least a significant section of the effective altruist community is not comfortable with suffering-focused ethics because they are worried that people will draw, as they would see it, the wrong conclusion, and that the way to end suffering is to is is to end to end life. And I've said that actually ending destroying Darwinian life, it's not realistic. We shouldn't go down this route, but there are scenarios, pretty horrific scenarios in some cases, that do make extinction possible. And yeah, the first thing most people will say will respond if you remark that you're a negative utilitarian is suddenly on the lines they know oh, you think we should be destroying, you know, plotting Armageddon or, or something like that. It's one of the reasons why I prefer to avoid the label. Even suffering focused ethics, a lot of people switch off. So back to your question. Sorry, that went a number of number of tangents there. A lot will depend on someone's strengths and backgrounds. If someone feels confident, for example, doing something like whether it's YouTube shorts, TikTok, uh, I'm, I'm not a professional philosopher. I, essentially, I write in a rather clotted academic style. The hedonistic imperative was written notionally for, for analytic philosophers. The whole landscape has changed and if you're confident enough to have your own you know do your own tiktok videos youtube go down that route um how the until re, I mean, there's been a shift of focus from avowedly tra transhumans to ea in recent years funded at least part by by FTX, since FTX exploded and various other factors too, uh, EA has been in the news for all the, all the wrong reasons. Mm. It's not clear how well the EA brand is going to uh, endure. Alternatively, there is a, I can really respect, there is a very good case for, for focusing on one particular kind of suffering and talk, you know, the abolitionist project, let's abolish all suffering, concept impossibly grandiose, focusing on something like, well, not something like, on animal agriculture. The, the, one of the best ways I know that we could radically reduce the burden of suffering in the world is to focus on shutting down slaughterhouses, not telling people they ought to be vegan, but imagine just enacting legislation that kicks in 10, 15 years down the line uh, we abolish all slaughterhouses. There's an insane poll that's been replicated. I didn't really believe it. That said, 47% or so of Americans would be sympathetic to the idea of closing slaughterhouses. I'm not telling them that they're wrong to eat meat. Simply, these ghastly slaughterhouse uh, uh, owners. Um, that's the whole. That's the weak point in the apparatus of exploitation. So, someone. Uh, as I said, a pig is as, as sentient and sapient as, I'm not sure sapient matters, sentient as a, as a pre-linguistic toddler, someone who wants to eventually get involved in, in animal activism, there is a very strong case for joining one of the organizations there. Uh, the save all, the shuttle slaughterhouses movement was gaining momentum just before COVID. I think it's the most promising, it's the weak link in, in the chain. Um, so 
yeah, by all means, uh, get in touch. In the old days, I used to say, get a get a website, and I still think there is a great case for someone you know who feels yeah to get a get a website, spread the word. But social media is much more prominent. Mm. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Thanks for all those uh, suggestions. Um, so I've got an audience question now. So, um, the the sort of if humans were to um, abolish their own suffering, I'm not sure exactly, and you know, maybe impossible to know, but I'm not sure exactly what the time frames will be for each of these different stages of, you know, eradicating human suffering, then moving on to other animals and and, and wild animals. Um, but if it is that humans are able to eradicate their own suffering first, would this not then cripple or lessen their ability to empathize with other sentient beings who can still suffer, for example, non-human animals? And may this then hinder the wider effort to abolish suffering? Yeah, a good question. But <laughs> consider there's something like uh, MDMA or ecstasy. A, it's an empathetic euphorian. Yes, taking MDMA involves a short-lived euphoria, but also tremendous love and empathy too. So, yeah, when we're talking about phasing out suffering in humans, one shouldn't imagine this as turning us into, in, in, into cokeheads. It's more a case of creating life based on gradients of intelligent well-being. And though suffering can make people more empathetic and concerned for non-humans, too much suffering... <laughs> can often frequently embitter too much suffering rather than creating a sense of moral urgency leads to sense of what psychologists call learned helplessness and behavioral despair uh, creating a world in which all humans go through life animated by gradients of, of, of well-being the happiest people also tend to be the most motivated too I mean, one of the problems with low mood depression and a lot of antinatalists have experienced depression or depressed or loved ones are depressed is that rather than, you know, the, the, the sheer urgency of tackling the, the problem of suffering, it just overwhelms and leads to, to helplessness and other things being equal. Uh, yeah, boosting hedonic set points, hedonic range leads to a world of active citizens well um let's hope that it doesn't lead us to uh becoming coked out because then the transhumanist utopia has already been achieved in london every saturday night <laughs> um so the next question um was again from the audience so i i was actually watching a video of you the other day and i think i and I, I can't remember how long ago this video was from, so you may have changed your view since then, but I think I heard you express skepticism as to whether um, artificial sentience will ever be, a, you know, in the form of artificial intelligence, you know, this is a conversation that's going on at the moment. If this is a form of sentience that will ever be able to come about, I don't, I don't know what your sort of views are on that at the moment, but the, the question from the audience is, um, how can the the methods of achieving a transhumanist future that you've been outlining um they you know they they seem to rely on like gene editing and and things like this um how can we speak about abolishing suffering in potential future digital sentient beings or just ensuring that if they ever come about they just wouldn't they wouldn't come about with the capacity for for suffering um yeah what, what are your general thoughts on that uh, generally i'm a super pessimist about most things but one of the things i don't worry about is digital minds and digital suffering uh, as far as i can tell the architecture of classical turing machines ensures that they can never solve the binding problem that their ignorance of sentience is architecturally hardwired that implementations 
of class of sorry that box has popped up i hope it's going to go away um my computer um yeah essentially it's only in a in a fundamentally quantum world it's only possible to implement classical turing machines thanks to decoherence quantum decoherence um but decoherence ensures that classical turing machines can never be unified subjects of experience this is the so-called binding problem the mystery of even if you think the hard problem of consciousness can be solved even if you think for example that individual neurons uh, can be conscious why aren't we so-called micro experiential zombies there's 86 bi 86 billion membrane bound pixels of experience and so fancifully think of a classical turing machine imagine replacing the ones and zeros with discrete pixels of experience however fast you execute the code and however complex your code running the code isn't going to create a unified subject of experience at most it would be a micro experiential zombie and though we see this ai revolution i've been as bowled over by chat gpt as, as as everyone else what we are not doing is creating minds unified subjects of experience with a pleasure pain access someone can say well how do you know this strictly i don't but if so-called strong emergence is the case then essentially the scientific world picture collapses one can explain exhaustively the behavior of classical digital computers without invoking minds, con uh, phenomenally bound consciousness or anything like that. Now I could, well, natural question arises, how is phenomenal experience, phenomenally bound experience possible in animal minds? I could give you a very speculative account now of why I think we are quantum minds running classical world simulations but someone needn't buy into these very speculative ideas to accept that essentially our machines are not going to wake up or at least not so long as they as their existing architecture is conserved that it's not incidental the insentience of classical digital computers that their their inability to solve the binding problem is completely hardwired Mm. So we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to ask you the last question now, and that is just simply, um, you've obviously you've presented your vision. What do you personally want to do with the remaining amount of time you know you've got on this earth, which obviously is uncertain for all of us? What what are, what are your personal aspirations or the contribution you want to make to this, and, and what are you working on at the moment? I yeah I mean I, I wrote the hedonistic imperative back in uh, 1995 it was written in this clotted academic style with academic philosophers in mind I jazzed it uh, up a bit um, but essentially yeah it, it needs rewriting updating uh, if H after is uh, Magnus Vinding kindly brought out uh, a collection of my essays uh but essentially i am i i hope to bring out a book the biohappiness revolution uh sometime in the next few years jump to the gun rather on uh, facebook someone uh, designed me some nice covers and yeah a very successful launch of my book covers but the actual book itself is <laughs> far far from uh, uh uh completion and yeah essentially a crisp uh, synopsis of the abolitionist project, uh, the biohappiness revolution, and essentially for a broad audience of life lovers. Mm. Too many people just switch off if you start talking about suffering. The only way to get away with saying just how awful life on earth is for some people is if you can promise them a happy ending. Mm. No, I, I think that would be amazing, to be honest. And I'm glad to hear you're you're working on something like that, because there have been a few books that have come out recently that have communicated ideas that a lot of, you know, people in philosophical circles are talking about. But they've released a book that is sort of, you know, that that has more popular appeal. Um, and I think I think that's I think that's really good. Um, so I'm glad to hear you're working on that. And I will definitely be there in Waterstones to get my copy. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, thank you so much, David, for 
coming on and being the first guest on the first ever Anti-Natalist Advocacy Conference. It's been great to have you and great to listen to your thoughts. Um, thank you, everyone, for submitting questions. The next, if you want to um, stay up to date with David, we will be sending out a newsletter later today with links and everything you need to know in there. So make sure to subscribe to the newsletter. There will be a link in the description. Um, the next session will be happening in around five minutes. And that will be John hosting with Seb Alex talking about the importance of animal rights. So thank you so much, David. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, everyone.